it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink and listen. I live in an uncharted country. Chapter 1 Ocalathron. I bet you've never heard of it. Well, it's an island off the coast of North and South America. It is indeed an independent country with a population of several thousand. It has its own history, its own unique culture, its own stories and legends. We have a stable system of government. There are cities with buildings and streets bustling with people. We have rural areas with farms and forests. Our country is completely normal, except for one single thing, one undeniable fact. Ocalathron isn't on any maps. It is an uncharted country. I found out about this anomaly when I was studying geography for school. I searched everywhere for our island on those maps. I spent at least a couple hours poring over them, but... Nowhere did I see a label or a dot indicating that our country even existed. It wasn't in the index. I even tried looking through maps online. I even googled Ocalathron, but nothing came up. I was so confused. That was when my dad came into the room and saw my desperate attempts to prove my country's existence. He told me something that I will never forget. Our country isn't on the map, he said. It's completely uncharted to the rest of the world. No one in America or Mexico or China or anywhere else in the world knows of Ocalathron. Just us. Just the residents of this island. But why? I asked. Hasn't anybody left or told others about this place? No, son, he answered. This country's never been discovered by anyone else, and it never will. And with that, he left me with my wild, racing thoughts. In my childhood mind, it seemed perfectly plausible that there could be a real, unsurveyed country. And besides, I didn't mind. It almost felt exciting, like I was sharing a big secret with every other resident in Old Calathron. I was perfectly content on our island, and I never get that I had to leave. No one I knew ever left our island, and they didn't need to. Everything we need is here. Each person that lives in Ocalathron is happy with their share. We have adequate food and resources, and the weather's nice most of the time. As a child, I never felt the slightest inclination to leave. But then, I met Philip. Philip Mercy, or Philly, as everyone else called him, was a bit of a delinquent. He was always breaking rules, skipping school, shoplifting, and speeding. He got into fights all the time and had to be held back twice. He was, in most everyone else's eyes, a juvenile criminal. But he was my friend. We were a strange match, a scrawny nerd with big red plastic glasses and a huge muscly kid covered in hair. Despite our differences, we made a great team from the moment we'd met each other in the schoolyard during the sixth grade. He used his strength and fear-imposing nature to defend me from bullies and whatnot, and I could use my good reputation and quick thinking to bail him out of trouble. Philly was the first person I knew that wanted to leave the island. <clears throat> Come on, he'd say. Think about it. Think about all the other places out there to see. Venice or Los Angeles or the Caribbean. We'll never see those places if we don't leave Ocalathron. But please, hear me out. Someday soon, we should leave the island. Well, I thoroughly disagreed with this idea. Aside from the fact that our parents didn't want us leaving... There was no way to leave. Ocalathron has no airport or any boats fit for long-distance travelling. The closest thing we have are a few speedboats that belong to some of the richer residents. On top of all that, no one knows which direction to go, or how long to travel. What, are we going to swim? I said jokingly, but inside I was serious about it. Look, it's not a good idea to leave, especially at our age. He'd always change the subject after that. We never truly got into a good conversation about it, and I didn't want to. We were fine in this place, and had no need to go anywhere else. We instead spent our time joyriding around town and watching sports games. Soccer is actually very popular in Ocalathron, and every child here spends a lot of time both playing and watching it. The ocean and the beaches are extremely popular locations here. 
Throughout the year, residents will swim in the ocean or just lay on the beach in the warm sun. The water's almost crystal clear during summer, but it's a lot more opaque in other seasons. Philly and I spent countless hours in the sea, catching small fish and splashing around. And everything changed one day, when I was 16. It was a pleasant April morning. The weather was the best it had been for a while. In fact, the weather forecast went so far as to say it was the nicest day of the year. Obviously, then, the beaches were crowded. Philly and I had a couple of them, but each of them were full of people, and we preferred having some elbow room. So we went to a lesser-known area. It was called Coral Beach, and there were only about ten people there. That part of the ocean was almost completely empty, save for one lone child of approximately ten swimming further away. At this time of day, the tide was fairly high, but the waves were pretty calm. We set down our towels and snacks on a tarp, and immediately ran to the sea. This was just a normal day for us. I actually lived extremely close to the ocean, could see it from my window, and, and Philly was only a few blocks back from me. Because of this, it was extremely convenient to come here at all times of year. I floated placidly on my back in the water, staring at the cloudless sky. It was a perfect blue. It almost looked fake, like someone had wrapped the world in a piece of blue cloth. The water was cool, but it wasn't too hot. There was a warm, pleasant breeze blowing. This was paradise, and I was living in it. This is why we stay in Ocalathron, I said to Philly. He nodded. Nobody could say that Ocalathron wasn't nice. Well, I took a deep breath, taking in the fresh spring air. Slowly I closed my eyes. Everything was so peaceful. I'd rather be here than anywhere else. I listened to the gentle breeze whistling through the brush and the sounds of the waves lapping against the shore. I think it was the stillness, the calmness, the lack of distraction that made me fall asleep. I didn't usually dream, but this time was an exception. I was in an unknown place. In fact, I was in an unknown country. I wasn't sure how I knew that, but I did. There was a heavy fog in the air, so much so that you couldn't even see two feet in front of you. I was standing on a beach, staring at the waves crashing in front of me. I was clad in heavy leather boots, baggy brown pants, and a navy blue shirt that was far too big for me. Someone shook me, and I turned over. Weathers, we've got to go, he roared. There isn't much time. Well, I followed him through the fog and to an enormous ship. He motioned for me to climb up a ladder that was positioned along the side, and I did. We only barely managed to hop on the boat before it took off into the fog. I could make out a silhouette through the fog. A big, broad-shouldered man wearing some sort of coat. Slowly he stepped closer, until I could see him. He was enormous, at least twice my size, and he had a beard that fell all the way to his waist. His hair completely covered his face, so I couldn't distinguish any features. He didn't speak, only grabbed me and pulled me through the fog. I couldn't see where he was taking me. The man yanked me past other people in a panic frenzy, trying to make me reach somewhere. And then he spoke to me with a gruff voice. Not safe. Has a leak. I understood what he meant somehow. I got down on my knees and grabbed a toolkit that I hadn't even noticed. I immediately began to search through the fog with my hands for the leak. There wasn't much I could do in this fog, and we were running out of time, according to the first man who'd pulled me on the ship. Eventually my hand went through a hole and touched the water below. I crawled towards it. The waves that were hitting the boat were now causing it to rock. I started to patch the leak, making use of the arsenal of tools I had at my disposal. I was almost completed. I just needed a few more minutes and we'd be safe. I looked up at the hairy man who brought me here. He looked back down. His expression was hard to read because of all his hair, but it seemed to be that of fear, of complete terror. Where there was it, it... Crash. Something smashed into the side of the boat. It was more than just a wave. It was a real creature, like a whale. Crash. Crash. Rain began pouring down upon us. I looked down and saw that a chunk of our ship had been taken out by whatever it was. 
The boat fell apart completely, splitting into two. People on both sides tumbled down, falling, falling into the water. I was submerged. And that's when I woke up. I flipped onto my stomach while I was sleeping. I stood back up in the shallow water, taking in a deep breath. Coral Beach didn't really have any coral in the water. It was just named after the man who discovered it. Philly swam over to me. You all right? Yeah, just had a weird dream. I looked back at the shore. The tide was coming in strong. The waves were higher and a lot of the beach was now covered in water. Most of the people were gone, save for one woman sitting in a chair. Suddenly a huge wave came crashing down upon the beach, and all our stuff came tumbling down towards the ocean. Oh, Philly ran to save our snacks from the sea. I was about to follow him, but stopped. The boy from earlier was still swimming, but this time he was much further away. In fact, he was much, much further away, just a little more than a speck on the horizon. He was splashing around happily, doing somersaults and whatnot. Suddenly he stopped and shouted towards the shore. Well, the woman who I presumed to be his mother looked up from whatever magazine she was reading. What was previously a look of contentment turned quickly to fear and dismay. She ran to the water as fast as she could toward her child. The boy looked confused, wondering why his mother was coming for him. He looked around. Nothing looked wrong. I too began to make my way closer to see what was happening. The kid started to splash around again, this time even more carelessly, growing further and further away from his mother. His mum tried desperately to get to him, but the waves fought against her. The boy stopped again. From where I was, it was hard to tell, but I could see his expression change. He went from happy and carefree to suddenly being in shock and horror. He stumbled away, trying to reach his mother, but no matter how much he tried to move, for whatever reason, he couldn't. He stayed stuck in place, splashing frantically. Is it a shark? I wondered. Well, the water wasn't very clear today, so I couldn't tell what was going on. I started fighting my way towards him, realizing he was in danger. But he was so far away, and the waves restricted us from making much distance. And then the boy broke free. He started moving again. He swam towards the shore, making plenty of headway. For a few seconds, I was relieved. He was safe. And then it happened. Something that has haunted me for the rest of my life. Behind the child, something came out of the water. It was completely black and covered in algae and barnacles. It was an arm. It reached out towards the boy, grabbing his foot with its long, spindly fingers. The arm held the child high above the shore. One of its fingers covered his mouth, but the look in his eyes was that of absolute terror. Then the arm pulled the child back, fast as it had appeared, back into the water. There wasn't much news coverage of the issue. In fact, hardly anybody knew about the boy's mysterious death. His mother, Philly and I had searched the water as much as we could without getting too close to the spot where he died, but we had no luck. He'd been taken for good. It was tragic. We showed up to his funeral, and it was almost empty. Just us and his closest relatives. We wanted to believe that he was fine, that he had come back, but we knew he wouldn't. It was so sad that on the nicest day of the year in Old Galathron, one of our residents, a child, had died so cruelly struggling with it on another level as well. I had seen an arm come out of the water. It was a huge arm, not the size of a human's. I wanted to believe that that too was just an illusion, that it had been my imagination. After all, I'd never seen or heard of anything like that before. No, it had to be my eyes playing tricks on me. The thought that there could be any sort of mysterious creature in our perfect country was absurd, totally absurd. But I did ask my dad what he thought of the whole situation, and the answer that I received still makes me shudder. Well, he tried to leave Okalathron.
Chapter 2 Woke up in the middle of the night, sweating and breathing heavily. I just had a nightmare. Couldn't quite remember what happened, but I knew it was terrifying. I exhaled. That boy's death was still on my mind, even a month after. It just didn't make any sense. How could something like that happen? I still wasn't quite sure what I'd seen. Well, I shouldn't say that I wasn't sure. I just wanted to be sure. I grew up on this peaceful island and never had any worries. How could I? Orkilathron was almost perfect. Well, it may have its ups and downs, but for the most part, my life was ideal. To see something so horrifying in the water of my country made me feel... betrayed. Everyone had been lying to me for 16 years. At least the adults had. And the children, like myself, had never been told about the mysterious creature that lives in the water. I threw the covers off. It was about 2am and nobody else was awake. I walked to the window, as I could see the beach from there. I love the way the moon reflects on the water. It's quite beautiful at night. Weathers Beach. That's the beach I can see from my window. Most people have forgotten its name, as the only indication of it is a rotting old wooden sign covered in ivy that's been halfway pushed into the ground. The light cast from the moon not only reflected on the water, but also illuminated a bit of the beach. I opened my window, letting the cool breeze float in. It was summer now, and my bedroom felt like a sauna. I turned back to the beach and saw something. At first, I couldn't tell what it was. It looked like a stingray, swimming placidly in the ocean. But it advanced and got closer to shore. From my second-story window... It was hard to tell its depth while it was swimming, but it was extremely large. It got closer and closer. It looked like a stingray, but now I had a better view of it, I was able to see some details. It appeared to be covered in little brown hairs. Now these hairs form lines which form patterns. And these patterns look like mazes. Mazes that covered the thing's entire body. Its body was covered in barnacles and algae, so the parts of his back were caked in green. I couldn't yet see its sting, or even if it had one. And then it lifted its back out of the water. It didn't have a sting, like I thought. No, indeed it had something much, much worse. Something I wished I'd never see again. A bulging black arm, covered in algae. It protruded out of its back, reaching, it seemed, towards me. I slammed the window closed and exhaled. That wasn't real. That was what I attempted to convince myself. It was just a stingray. My eyes were playing tricks on me. I'd just woken up and my eyes weren't quite adjusted to the light yet. Maybe because of that I'd simply seen a stingray and imagined the arm. I headed into my kitchen trying in vain to forget what I'd just seen. I made myself a pimento cheese sandwich, and for whatever reason, I find that they helped me relax. It was two in the morning. Sighing, I went back into my room and tried to get to sleep. Well, all of my attempts were useless, and I couldn't get a wink of sleep, no matter how hard I tried. Thoughts stampeded through my head like a herd of wild bison. Or Calathron, the boy... The secret, the stingray with the arm. They were all connected. They had to be. I threw my covers off again and walked to my window. Staring out at Weathers Beach, I didn't see anything out of the ordinary. Just some waves lapping softly against the sandy shore. The only thing that could be counted as suspicious were a few little ripples in the sea beyond. Would you uh, mind explaining to me what we're doing here? Philly groaned. I have an an appointment later. Yeah, right, I said. An appointment with the Okalathron police force. I walked over to the counter with a stack of books in my arms. I didn't normally care much for reading, but my insatiable hunger for answers had brought me here, the library. Interested in our country's history, young man? The old librarian asked. Something like that, I mumbled. After that, we walked back out to Philly's car, which he insisted we take. It was a beat-up, old, red Toyota. 
foam was coming out of the seats and the ceiling was falling in, but he loved it. As we sat down on the soda-stained seats, I pulled out the bag of books. Oh, are we reading them right now? Philly asked. I ignored him and started flipping through the pages of the book. A volume titled, A History of Ocalathron. No, no, I said, after just a few minutes of reading. There's nothing about our beginning in here. Just a bunch of stories of things that happened to the founders of this island. So it doesn't say how they got here? No. I continued reading through the books on the way home. There was nothing in any of them about how our founders got here, or why they came. We simply skipped straight ahead to how they discovered Old Calathron's main food source. It made no sense. Hey man, let's take a break from all this, my friend urged. Yeah, sure, I replied. Philly pulled into his driveway. We stepped out and walked over to the steps, sitting down on the hot brick. We sat in silence for a while, him cleaning his fingernails out with his pocket knife and me just staring off into space. My mind began to drift away from the books and toward my dream of the night before. Slowly it came back to me. I remembered my nightmare. MacArthur, I groaned, opening my eyes groggily. Even this simple movement seemed to hurt. I was in pain. Something horrible had happened. Weathers, where, where are... The man next to me said weakly. He was fat, and hair covered most of his body. This was MacArthur, the man who'd been with me on the ship. It looks like... I stopped. Pain overwhelmed me whenever I performed any action, even blinking or speaking. I just laid on the ground, staring up at the sky. It was clear and perfectly blue. I could barely see a few trees out of the corner of my eye. Their leaves extended quite far, supported by spindly branches. I could hear the sea next to me, washing along on the shore. I was laying on the sand. Eventually the tide came in and the water reached me where I was laying completely motionless. It flowed over me for a little bit and got into my eyes. I sat up and rubbed the salt out of them. Finally, I was moving again. It still hurt, but it wasn't as bad as before. I looked around. No sign of MacArthur or any of the other people who'd come down with the ship. I wondered where they could be. I slowly stood up and began making my way along the beach. As I walked, I couldn't help but notice the natural beauty of the island. It looked completely undisturbed by the human race, like an undiscovered island that only I knew about. The questions of where my comrades had gone soon faded away as I started to explore the island. Oh, the gorgeous palm trees, the crystal clear water, and the amazing climate filled me with joy and made me forget my pain. I wandered about, all around the island and eventually into the woods. As I passed the tree line I began to wonder if there were any other people around. Did anybody live on this island? Where were the other people on the boat? Were there any dangerous animals about? Suddenly, something jumped out at me. I leapt back and fell into a bush. Its sharp thorns jabbed into me as the figure who'd surprised me walked forward. It was MacArthur. Behind him now I could see other figures. Some of my other shipmates. What's... what's going on? I asked. MacArthur answered. Young dead. I think he drowned. Not sure of location. Another person stepped out of the trees. A woman named Ingot. Young tried to swim, and he went under. It was like he was pulled down. We think he drowned, but... She trailed off. Heinz Young had been with us on the ship as our navigator. Now we were deserted on some island in the middle of the ocean. Suddenly I began to hear fast footsteps coming from the woods. Is anybody else... I didn't need to finish that sentence. Ingot's eyes widened, and we began to run. I thought about the dream all the way home from Philip's house. It was strange, almost uncanny. That dream seemed like a direct sequel to the dream that I'd had a month before. I still remembered that one. I tend to remember all of my dreams, as I hardly ever have them. As I brushed my teeth late that night, 
I couldn't help but think that that island was Ocalathron. It seemed similar, and the name Weathers sounded just like the beach next to my house. Maybe my dreams were being formed subconsciously by the things I'd thought about, but having them correlate so closely together felt unreal. The looming question of my country's founding continued to plague me. Every one of those books had been useless, and none of them had mentioned the creature with the arm. As I lay down in bed, I couldn't help but think that what I thought to be a stingray might have had something to do with the founding of the town, and why we can't leave the island. Well, these thoughts haunted me as I laid in bed, desperately hoping for sleep. I hadn't rested well since that child's death that day in April. Witnessing something like that will haunt you forever, wherever you go. Even if I couldn't figure out what had killed him, I regretted not having done enough to save him in the first place. Then I heard a noise that ripped me out of my thoughts. A scratching noise. It was rhythmic, as if someone was scratching to a beat. Scratch, scratch, scrape, scratch. Scratch, scratch, scrape, scratch. It was horrible, like nails on a chalkboard. The sound of fingernails scraping against the brick of my house made my skin crawl. And whoever it was doing it was directly under my window. I thought if I ignored it, it would go away. Well, that proved to be unsuccessful after spending half an hour under my blankets. I decided, reluctantly... To investigate the scratching. I attempted to look at an angle to see out of my window. I couldn't see down far enough to tell what it was, no matter how hard I tried. I sighed. I would have to open my window. I carefully unlocked it and placed my fingers under the lip that was used to open it. I didn't know what gave me the earnest desire to uncover the mystery of the scratching, but I was determined. I pulled it open slowly and quietly as I could. It made a loud screeching noise as I tugged it. I winced. The scratching continued in its same rhythm. I slowly moved my head down and towards the outside of my window. My breath was held. I was sure my face was turning purple at this point. I slid my head out the window and looked down. I expected to see a possum, or a tree branch, or some natural, more explainable source of the scratching. Instead, when I peeked out of the window, the scratching stopped. And what I saw instead was absolutely horrifying. The arm was outstretched towards my face, as if it were going to grab me. I slammed the window shut on my head, and I roared in pain. My head was stuck. I had never seen the thing so close before. It stank of rotting flesh, and indeed I could see parts of exposed muscle and bone underneath the skin. Small bugs and creatures festered in it, almost making it look like it was twitching. The hand groped for my head, and after a few tries, touched it. Its skin felt moist and tender. In a moment of sheer desperation, I bit its finger. I immediately wanted to vomit. If possible, it tasted worse than it looked or smelled. It tasted like spoiled milk, like rotten meat, like rust and raw eggs, and I gagged. Luckily, my plan seemed to work. The arm retracted long enough for me to pull the window back open and pull my head back inside my house. I threw up right after that. Thankfully, I made it to my bathroom in time. When I came back out after rinsing my mouth with soap, it was gone. Even after all this, I desperately wanted to believe that it wasn't real. That all of this was in my head. But the taste of its finger was still in my mouth. I could remember that creature in so much detail. It just wasn't possible that that thing wasn't real. I sat down at my bed, not knowing what to do or how to react to all this. It was all so wrong. A monstrous, stingray-like creature with an arm spreading out of his back. Well, it seemed impossible, but still, I had just seen it with my own eyes less than five minutes before. Now I needed to do something. I needed to talk to someone. We were all in danger. This thing was living in Ocalathron, keeping us from leaving. The island is dangerous. No one else in the world knew of its existence. 
And now, I was starting to agree with my friend. We had to go. Chapter 3 Bro, you must have been high, Philly said to me. Or you're lying. No, really, you know I don't do that sort of thing. Also, when have I ever lied to you? I don't know, he said. What if you never told me that you lied? What if your name isn't really Drew? What if it's... Oh, come on, man, I pleaded. That arm, I've been seeing it. When that kid got killed, when I woke up last night, the taste is still in your mouth. My friend finished my sentence for me. Uh, don't worry about it. You're just tired, or maybe it was a super vivid dream. Whatever the case, it's fine. You yourself know that. You've been vouching for it ever since I met you. Well, he brought up a good point. I told Philly about the night before, the scratching, the biting the hand, and my wild theories. He assured me it was just my imagination, and that all of this was just some crazy coincidence. There was nothing to worry about, and I should just live my life as usual. I wasn't entirely on board with the coincidence theory. Everything was too synchronized, too perfect. The sensations were all too realistic. It couldn't just be a dream. Well, I hung up on him, thanking him before making myself a late lunch. Sixty-second rice would have to do for now. My mum and dad were on vacation, and I didn't feel like cooking an extravagant meal just for myself. And by vacation, I meant that they were on a trip to another city in Okilathron. It wasn't uncommon for them to do this, go on a trip for a few days, and then come back with new ideas for ways to set up our den and kitchen. I could spend a week or so in the house without any trouble, so they let me stay behind. I gazed out the dining room window and into the street. It was broad daylight, and I doubted that the creature would show itself on the street. I watched a few kids running and playing in the streets. No cars were driving about on this lazy Saturday. I felt relaxed, just listening to the birds chirping in the trees, the sound of the waves, and the children laughing. They appeared to be playing a game of hide-and-seek. I remember the days when I used to play the game myself, the pleasant days when I was a kid. There were three of them, two boys and one girl. One of the boys, he had blonde hair, covered his face with his hands and counted loudly. His comrades dispersed, running to and fro about the neighborhood. There were woods directly behind the houses, and both of them ran into them, spreading out into the trees. For once, I wasn't thinking about the creature or old Calathron. I was reminiscing about my childhood, the games I used to play, the things I used to love, the things that scared me. I remembered old adventures I'd had, going into the woods at night with Philly, We'd tell each other ghost stories in the dark, and would hide under the bed whenever we heard the slightest noise from outside. I remembered specific events, such as the time I wet my pants when a squirrel ran by, or when Philly and I tried filming a movie in the woods, only to realise we didn't have any cartridges after walking for an hour to get our filming location. I'd lived a great life in Okalathra. None of these things could be happening here. There were no arms in the water, no giant stingray, no scratching in the dark. Everything was just a coincidence. The blonde boy was searching around, in bushes and behind trees. Eventually it dawned on him that they might be in the forest beyond. He began making his way towards it, stopping every foot to check around for them. Oh, the days when I used to play in those woods were long past. When we were younger, we spent a lot of time in there, exploring and building forts. A lot of little incidents, fun stories we had to tell about that forest, and the things that had happened to us. Then I remembered something that had happened to us. It was a story we'd never told our parents or anyone else about. We'd simply chosen to forget. But now it played itself out to me in full, everything we'd seen rushing back to me. Are you sure your mom said we could go this far? Eleven-year-old me said. Uh, yeah, she did, said Philly. What? Are you scared? Well, it is getting pretty dark. There's nothing to worry about. Philly tossed me a flashlight. If there's light, nothing's going to come after us. We forced our way through leaves and bushes that blocked our way. The flashlights didn't do much good, being obscured by vegetation, but they made us feel safer. 
Small cracks of illumination came through the trees from the moon, but despite all this, it was still pitch black. As we walked, we could hear rustling around us. It was unsettling knowing that we might not be alone. We didn't speak to each other, we just kept walking. Soon, we reached a clearing. Philly shoved a branch out of our way, and then we saw it. There was a circle of trees surrounding this clearing. Both of us gasped when we saw it. An old ruinous structure, here in the woods. It was made of stone, the cracked pillars barely supporting the crumbling roof. Sections of it were covered with moss. A drape of ivy concealed what appeared to be an entrance. It wasn't very tall, but it filled most of the clearing. Cool, Philly said. Let's go inside. He was already halfway to the doorway. Wait, I cried. What if, what if there are snakes? What if there's poison oak? Don't be afraid, he cat. And so I followed him to the structure. All was silent, save for our soft footsteps crushing the leaves below. No animals ran about. No wind blew through the trees. It was creepy, being in the woods in the middle of the night. Well, Philly barged on, however, and I followed. As we reached the ivy, my friend pushed it aside, slowly for dramatic effect. I held my breath, half expecting some unspeakable horror to leap out at us from the dark depths. But nothing did and I exhaled, relieved. Let's keep going, Philly said, rubbing his hands together. He didn't wait for my response, but pressed on. I nervously followed. The inside of the ruins were even more terrifying. They seemed bigger on the inside than from the outside. I shone my flashlight around, examining it. An enormous, cracked marble table took up quite a bit of the space, a long fissure ran along the length of it. Moss practically coated the table. On the other side of the room, two crumbling statues stood. I gasped. What? my friend asked. Those... I stammered. Those are our founders, remember? Those drawings in the history books. Philly nodded. I shone my flashlight further into the room. Another small doorway greeted me. This one, too, covered in ivy. We walked toward it quickly, making no noises except for our echoing footsteps. As we advanced, I looked around with my light. Small worms and insects crawled through the area. I shivered. Their squishing sounds were the only ones that accompanied us as we walked. I reached the ivy-covered doorway before my friend. He caught up and stopped right behind me. Do it, he said. Okay, I answered weakly. I didn't want to, but I also didn't want to look like a wimp. Taking a deep breath, I drew the ivy to the side. In the room before us, there sat a throne of marble. It too was cracked and overgrown with weeds. To its sides, there stood rusted suits of armor, each holding charred stubs of rotting wood, which most likely had been torches centuries before. What I assumed to be old, tattered tapestries hung on the walls, and an ancient, falling-apart carpet stood between us and the throne. Its colour was once probably a vibrant purple, but now it was a washed-out grey. We didn't take notice of any of that at first. The only thing we noticed was the skeleton. It sat on the throne, wearing tattered old robes and rusted jewels on its head. Worms crawled through its skull, in through one eye socket and out through the other. Its head was tilted, just slightly, and it was staring right at us. We screamed and I started to run, but Philly pulled me back. Hold up, he said. That thing's dead. There's no need to run. Let's check it out. You can go look at it, I replied, but I'm creeped out. I just want to go home. Oh, fine. He started toward the skeleton taking slow steps towards it. I watched intently. He walked right up to it, reached out and touched its skull. It creaked further to the side. Philly tilted his head up to the right and leaned in closer. I tensed up. He ran his hand along the skeleton's bony arms. And then, suddenly, he screamed and spun around. I'd already started to run, and he was close behind, 
We screamed all the way, and I have never run faster in my life. Adrenaline pulled us forward until we reached my house. We collapsed on my bed once inside. My friend looked at me. I... Uh, there was... Uh, there was no need for him to finish his sentence. We'd both seen it. A shadow behind the throne had moved, and right before we turned to run, we saw an unusual-looking thing step out from behind. We didn't have much time to look at it, but now that I was remembering it five years later, I could have sworn that it was the same patterned being that had tormented me. I was afraid to go to sleep that night, afraid that that creature would come back, that I would hear scratching and scraping, that I'd see an arm at my window reaching in for me. I made sure every door and window was locked before locking and barricading my bedroom door. That thing was not going to come in my room. And I sat down on my bed and waited. No signs of scratching. If something was outside, I couldn't hear it. My clock read ten o'clock. I waited another hour. Nothing. I waited another half hour. Still nothing. After another fifteen minutes, my eyelids began to feel heavy. I couldn't keep my eyes open. I laid down fully. And soon, I was fully succumbed to sleep. Run! 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 Ingot screamed. She was far ahead of MacArthur and I. I could barely see her silhouette in the trees as I ran. This forest was immense, and we were running deeper into it. Whatever was behind was gaining on us. I could hear rustling from behind. Not exactly like footsteps, but like a sliding. Like something was gliding close to the edge of the forest floor, coming in contact with leaves and brush. Tears filled my eyes as I ran. The cold wind stung them, and salty droplets flew out. I was focused only on not tripping over. All hope will be lost the second I fell or stumbled. Our pursuer's pace remained steady, flying through the trees at a constant rate. What was behind us, and why was it after us? My blood turned to ice when I heard a horrified bellow. MacArthur's screams echoed behind us as we advanced. We couldn't turn back. We knew that it was already too late. The roars died out as he was, we assumed, consumed by the thing that followed. We must have run like that for at least five or ten minutes. I was running out of breath. My legs felt heavy. I could hardly see for the tears in my eyes. I turned to the side. Something was next to me, a massive, towering creature who blocked out the sun. It was covered in strange brown patterns that snaked across its sides. It had an arm sprouting outside its back, protruding out towards me. I squeezed my eyes shut, and then I stumbled hard. I landed on my back, staring straight up toward the sky. Soon, it was blocked by a large mass that glided over me. It was thinner than I'd thought. It must have been on its side when it was chasing me. Its underside was a cold grey, and pulsing red veins were clustered in various spots. I screamed in absolute horror. There was nothing I could do. It came down upon me, fast, and I screamed. And that was when I woke up. Woke up to a nightmarish sight. The creature was looming over me, its patterned body folded up, as if poised to pounce. Chapter 4 I was completely frozen in shock and terror. It had never been in my house before. Oh, I wanted to scream. I wanted to kick it in the chest. I wanted to run. But I couldn't. I was frozen in place, just staring at it as it loomed over me. I knew what it was going to do. Somehow I knew that it realized that I'd discovered the secret of my country, at least to an extent. I had discovered it. The creature was never supposed to be found out. He lived. He thrived on this island. 
I remember at elementary school, some children in my school would come to school one day and the next they wouldn't be there. They would never come back. I could even remember their names and faces, students who had gone missing. Cara James. She was a girl I'd had a crush on in the third grade. Michael Mintz. Well, he was my bully in the seventh grade. Mr. Peter Starch wasn't even a child. He was my fifth grade teacher. Each of them had vanished without a trace. They were never mentioned in the news or even in town gossip. The only people who mentioned them were fellow students, whispering in the halls of the school. And now I knew why. Now I knew what had happened. This creature had taken them, killed them, and consumed them. It thought they were trying to leave a Calithron. But it couldn't be caught. If it was discovered, then it would be in danger. But the adults knew about it. Why did they never try to leave? Why didn't they try to stop it? And why didn't they tell us? All of these thoughts flew through my head in a flash. The creature reared back, about to attack. It was a lot bigger than I remembered. He towered over me, at least eight foot above me. I knew it was practically flat, but it was still terrifying. Passing red veins beat on its sickly grey underbelly. Its small, beady eyes were completely black, glinting in the moonlight. It began to dive onto me, but just in time I managed to roll myself off the bed. On the way down, I hit my head on the nightstand next to my bed. Sticky blood dripped down on my face, and the creature crashed against the headboard. And that's when it made a strange noise. It sounded like a horse's scream. A shriek of rage and pain. It sounded like metal scraping against metal. The guttural screech echoed through the night. I shivered and almost stopped in place. I broke away and began crawling out of the room as fast as I could. The thing swooped around and toward me from behind. I kicked it, planting my foot square in its eyes. Another scream exploded from behind. I scrambled to my feet and stumbled toward the window. I felt it brush against me. From the corner of my eye, I saw it wrapping itself around me, about to smother me. I pushed past it and made my way to the window. Without a second thought, I pulled it open and leaped out. I hit the bushes beneath the window with a thud. Pain shot through my knees, which I had landed on. In desperation, I forced my hands in front of me, grasping the grass ahead. Drawing all the strength from within my body, I pulled myself up. My stomach slid across the ground. I clawed my way forward another inch, and then another, and I advanced slowly. From behind, I could hear the patterned creature struggling to force its way through the window. Oh, the neighbors. I had to make it to my neighbor's house. I crawled all the way to the rock bed beside the neighbor's house. The stone stabbed into my hands, but I didn't care. I heard a loud crunching noise followed by several thuds. The monster had broken through the side of my house. I pulled myself into their bushes. The weeds were fairly tall and they somewhat covered me. The creature's shadow washed over me. I rolled behind and practically into a rose bush. Thorns quickly drew blood. The thing flew at me, faster than ever. I held my breath. I couldn't see much through the leaves, but it advanced quickly through the air, flying straight into the thorns. It stuck itself directly into the bush. It was less than six inches away from my face. Another screech came from the thing. It backed up and charged back into the thorny bush at me. Another shriek came roaring from it. It was stuck. It had tried to escape, but it was trapped. It continued to scream. I prayed that someone would hear it, that someone would help. But no one ever came. I was alone, right next to a vicious beast. Shriek after shriek came from it, but it couldn't untangle itself. Red blood dripped from its veins and onto the stones beneath. After several minutes, it went limp. It wasn't dead. Its veins and arteries were still pulsing, but it wasn't moving other than that. And the screeching stopped. 
Eventually, I worked up the courage and strength to move. I crawled out of the rock bed. Carefully, I made my way around the creature and staggered off of my neighbor's property and toward Philip Mercy's house. It was gone. By the time I managed to make it to Philly's house, pound on his door and wait for him to answer, and then drag him down to my neighbor's rosebush, it had left, vanished into the night. Listen, this is getting ridiculous, my friend said groggily. I'm not coming out here again. Your stupid stingray business is getting out of hand. But this is... No, I can't do this anymore. It's, it's just... He was interrupted, interrupted by a sound neither of us had ever heard before, and a sight we'd never seen before, save for in movies and television shows. A loud whirring came from above us, the sound of blades slicing through the air. We looked up and saw a helicopter flying through the sky. But something was wrong. Sparks were flying and smoke was escaping from it. It was crashing down farther and farther away from us. From where I was, I could see someone screaming in the chopper as it fell. However, their voice was drowned out by the noises coming from the crashing helicopter. Me and Philly glanced at each other, then took off in the helicopter's direction. The forest. More specifically, the clearing with the ruins. We ran all the way through the woods as fast as we could. No one else in the Calathron came, however. Maybe their parents were keeping them inside. Whatever the case, we were alone. We were both still in our pyjamas, only just having thrown on shoes. It was freezing cold and both of us were exhausted. We darted through the dense forest, making our way toward the wreckage and the screams. It must have taken us half an hour or more to get there. Thorns stabbed into our feet and bugs flew in our eyes the whole way, and we were miserable. Neither of us spoke. We just pushed our way into the clearing ahead. The ruins were standing tall before us, but more crumbled and cracked than the last time I'd been there. The helicopter had landed on top, head first into the building. Large chunks of mossy stone had lodged themselves into the ground. I could barely see the figure in it, but he appeared to be limp. We went around the ruin. From what we could tell, there was no way to climb in from the outside. That meant we had to find a way in from the inside. Well, my friend and I raced inside knowing there wasn't much time left. The darkness closed in on me, pushing in. I felt a strange uneasiness, and it had nothing to do with the helicopter crash. Was it in here? Did that creature cause the crash? I didn't have time to worry about it. I continued on into the darkness. Philly and I entered the next room. The room with the throne. The room with the skeleton. It was too dark to see the skeleton, but the throne was visible. Slight bits of moonlight came in through the cracks in the wall, illuminating the area a little. And then I saw them. Philly! I motioned for him to follow me. There was a set of stairs leading up to the top. I took a deep breath and began to climb. The stairs were steep and led up high. They were also small and pressed deeply into the wall, meaning I could barely fit my foot on one. Whoa, Philly said. I glanced back. A stair had fallen behind him as he stepped onto it. I turned back and continued onward. Uh, Drew, my friend said. I looked back again. Philly was staring at the stair behind him. A crack had opened up at the bottom and was coming up towards us, breaking the steps in its path. While well, we took off up the stairs, loud thuds and crashes could be heard as pieces of stone fell behind us. I bounded upstairs. The smoke from the top had floated into the ruin, making it hard to see and breathe. I finally managed to leap onto the roof through a small gap in the ceiling. Suddenly, I heard a scream from behind me. I looked back to see Philip, clutching onto the side of the gap, while his hand was slipping and he was dangerously close to falling. 
It took me a second to react. I leaned over and grabbed his arm. He roared as I pulled him back up. As soon as his feet touched the roof, we bolted for the chopper that had fallen. It was in pieces. The front windshield was broken and the blades were barely attached. I carefully pulled the front off while Philly helped the pilot out of the helicopter. With a few tugs, we managed to get him out. There were several bloodstains on his shirt. He had glass lodged in places all over his body. His arms and hands were charred, and he immediately collapsed once we helped him out of the chopper. We pulled him to safety against a nearby stone. We propped him up on it, and he leaned back to face the sky. Thank you, he groaned in pain. What happened? I said. How much does it hurt? What do you need? I... Something flew out at me. Something? Yeah. He closed his eyes. Philip started to dislodge the bits of glass and metal from his skin. It had strange patterns on his body. Philly looked at me. And it, it had an arm on his back. Everything was silent. He stopped breathing. His pulse stopped. His heart wasn't beating. Tears filled our eyes. We just sat there next to the dead man's body, staring at each other. Must have been an hour before one of us spoke. Philly said, Is it true? Is that thing? I nodded. We continued to sit in silence. The flame died down. There was no light. We were all alone in the dark woods. After a while, I peeked into the ruin. No way down. The stairs were completely gone. It was too tall for us to jump to safety. I took a deep breath. As I exhaled, I thought I heard something in the distance. I waited. A second or two later, it came again. The sound of leaves being rustled. Then a different sound came. And this sounded familiar, like I'd heard it before, recently. It almost sounded like a scream, a hoarse scream. Hide. What? Why? Don't argue. Hide. We crouched down behind the wreckage. It swooped down over us. I could see its form landing on the helicopter pilot's body. We both held our breath, watching it. It turned slowly, black eyes gleaming in the moonlight toward us. It screeched louder than ever, and lifted its arm in a claw-like gesture. I thought about the creature and all that it had done. It had killed children and consumed them. It had taken that boy at the beach. It had taken my peers and teachers in school, and it had killed this helicopter pilot. It stopped people from discovering Ocalatron, and that meant killing them. It was actively trying to kill me because it knew I had visions. It knew that I knew its secrets. All the adults just complied. They let it happen. But not me. Oh, it was time to end this. My dreams meant something. I knew it now. Weathers and his friends had stumbled upon this island centuries ago. This thing had killed them off one by one. It killed him. Only a few survived the beast. And they never told anyone about it. They never tried to escape. They just lived out their lives. Before I even registered what I was doing, I'd reached into the wreckage and pulled out a metal pipe. This was over. This was it. I stepped out from behind, weapon in hand. I didn't look to see what my companion did. I just walked until I was parallel with the monster. The patterns on its back seemed to swirl. I couldn't see much save for what the moonlight allowed, but I didn't care. The thing jumped into the air, floating effortlessly. I knew a thousand before me had tried and failed this, but if I was going to die, it would at least be for a noble cause. Quick as a flash, it dived toward me. I stood my ground. As it reached me, I swung. The pipe hit the creature, knocking it off balance and into the destroyed helicopter. Its arm shot out, grabbing me by the throat. I swung again, hitting its elbow. It let go. 
I walked toward it, sending swing after swing in its direction. I poked, jabbed, and sliced. The thing made several attempts to fight back, but I had a newfound strength in me that I'd never had before, and I beat it to the ground. From the corner of my eye, I saw movement. And then Philly stepped toward the beast with a sharp shard of metal in his hand. He stabbed it repeatedly. I stepped to the left, giving him room. Together we fought the beast side by side, stabbing and slashing, and we beat it to a pulp. Adrenaline pushed us forward, fueling our wrath. About ten minutes later, we stopped. The thing had gone limp. Not for good, but this time I think it's as close as it ever will be to being dead. I know it won't die. It can't. But it's out for now. And we finally worked up the courage to jump. Oh, it hurt, but it was better than staying up there. Me and Philly are in my house at the computer right now. Typing this out. Ready to share this with the world. We're doing this to get the word out. This needs to be said. There is an uncharted country off the coast of North and South America. Its coordinates are unknown, but it is close enough for someone to find it, seeing as a helicopter managed to crash here. So please, help us. Send your military, or your police force. Save us. Get us out of here. There's an uncharted country called Ocalithron, and we need your help. So I don't know about you, but um, I thought that one was really interesting, but left a lot of questions to be answered. How did they get an old Toyota onto that island when nobody knew about them? Hmm. Well, I think there's at least another story as long as this one there to be written to uh, tie up the loose ends and to carry it forward. But well, we'll see what the author wants to do. Um, I really, really like that one. Um, well. <laughs> Yeah, I could go on about it, but yeah, something about that story really intrigued me. I like the whole idea of a uncharted island off the coast of America. Well, that's enough for me for this evening. I'll be back again very soon. You're going to join me, aren't you? Go on, say you will. Go on, go on, say you will. Yes, there you go. Well, again very soon. Until next time, very, very sweet dreams. And bye-bye. Thank you so much for taking the time to listen to this story today. Really means a lot to me and to the author of the story, of course. Well, if you want to know more about me, I'm pretty much everywhere on social media. You can find me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. You can download my music on SoundCloud. Um, I've got a Patreon if you feel like. Throw me a dollar or two. Very much appreciated. And of course, on Reddit, I have a place where you can leave stories if you want me to read one that you've written. Well, hoping to see you all again very soon. Till then, sweet dreams. Bye-bye.